of really major than uh, you know, either one or two things happen. Right. I messed up so bad the first time that you want to give an opportunity to do it again. Well, we said the first time that we encourage you to come back. But we want to thank you for the invitation. Thank you for the hospitality and giving thanks. What the major thing is this, we came in, my wife and I, and, uh, I've heard it said and I agree with it, people don't have to be nice to us. To the brother major, to the esteemed pastor, uh, president of the Baptist Ministers Association of Augusta, my friend, to all of those from coming or alluding to y'all don't get upset with me, I just have to do what I have to do to those, the, the members of the greatest church in the world. Concerning 
and those of Christ. How many know that there are those who will lie about what the church All right. All right. All right. or the body of Christ ought to be doing and shouldn't be doing? Yes. So we need to know the truth. But not only that, then there's a third line. The third line is simply a life lived in accordance with the position of grace. In other words, Paul tells us how we are supposed to live because we have grace. And my brothers and sisters, I was submit to you that chapters 4 and chapters 5 contain a tree on the expected behavior of a born-again believer. Are there any believers in the house? Amen. Amen. If you don't believe me, I would submit to you that it's, it comes in the form of this tree that I would like to make my thesis for tonight. Yeah. Just for a few moments, I'm going to talk to you from this thesis, the responsibility of the church. Yeah. The responsibility of the church. Uh, Reverend Ross, I believe that perhaps there's somebody already in the mind that's turned off because they said the responsibility of the church, that doesn't affect me. But well, just stick around long enough to listen uh, to the rest of it and you understand that this speaks to the pulpit to the door. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. My brothers and sisters in this letter, uh, this is one of the first letters that Paul penned from the Roman jail. All right. The letter is one of the most impersonal letters that Paul writes. It simply means that Paul writes this letter not to a Pacific church, to a Pacific problem in the church. Uh -huh. It's believed uh, that this is a letter that is mentioned in Colossians chapter 4 that was meant to go to those the church at Laodicea and that it was stopped at our emphasis on its way. The importance of this letter is the fact that Paul writes this letter in such a way that it's so impersonal that it covers the entire church body. Yeah. In other words, what I'm saying is that even though Paul wrote this letter from a Roman jail, it is applicable to us in the church today. My brothers and my sisters, I believe that in the church today, Reverend Booker, that we can find many immature members in the church. And these members are like immature children. They want what they want, and when they don't get what they want, they make a deal, a big deal about it by throwing fits and crying, and they don't care whether anybody else is hurt or not. They just want what they want. Oh, they don't cry like babies cry when you take their candy away from you, but you can hear them crying that we don't do things like that. We haven't done it like that before. I don't know why Rev wants to do it that way. I don't know why they're crying on this side of the church. I don't know. I don't know. We don't. But they, they cry and, and complaining because they are immature children in the church. They take no responsibility for their actions, nor for what happens in the household of faith. Yes, uh, in other words, they can come in and jack up uh -huh. the pastor's program. Uh -huh. And then they want to blame the pastor for what they, uh -huh. what they did. Uh -huh. I, I, I know this is not what you wanted tonight, but, but, but this is what God gave us. And, and, and so when you look at these, these immature members of the church. Uh -huh. Their focus is on themselves and themselves only. Yeah. Yeah. They expect the pastor, like the parents, to provide all of their needs without concern of how the pastor is going to do. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But I stopped by tonight to help somebody. I stopped by tonight to help some ill-informed, born-again Christian to help them out of their misinformation. Uh, uh, the operation, the success, the effectiveness of the church is really more of your responsibility than it is the pastor's. Let me say that one more time because perhaps somebody didn't understand what I said. I'm saying that the members of the church, that, that the operation, the success, the effectiveness, and uh, the success of the church is more the responsibility of its members than it is of its pastor. I believe that if we do a conceptual and a contextual analysis of this complete letter that Paul writes, then we will discover at least five responsibilities of a born 
of his belief. Uh, for my seminarians, uh, I want you to understand that I understand good homiletics and, and I understand working the context of the text. But in this letter, if I would submit to you that if you go back and do your research, if you read yeah. Yeah. all of chapter 4 and all of chapter 5, yeah. you will find in chapter 4 and chapter 5, these five responsibilities are addressed. The first responsibility that the church has is a moral Responsibility. Right, 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 right. I'm submitting you that it's easy to find the, 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 the morality that I talks about that Paul talks about as far as sexual morality. Right. We, we understand that it's an immoral thing to commit fornication. We understand that it's immoral to commit adultery, but there's some other immorality that's in the scripture that is the responsibility of the church. Yeah. Right. I believe somebody said a little better. But behavior can be regulated. Oh, yeah. You say judicial decrees may not change the heart, but they can restrain the heart. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. In other words, the morality of the church ought to not be dictated by man. It ought to not be dictated oh, no. by the laws, but yeah. ought to be dictated by God and His law. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. And Martin came back and he asked this question. He said, How does one determine what a law? or unjust. Right. I want to say I'm glad Martin asked that question. Uh -huh. And so he gave an answer. He said a just law is a man-made code uh -huh. that yes. squares with the moral law or the law of God. Uh -huh. In other words, what he said is that, that a just law is a law that is in line with what God has said. Uh -huh. And anybody who's lived in the limit of time understands that man's morality changes as man changes. Man will say something is right Responsibility, 
remember you? Oh, I'm glad I asked myself that question. We, we have a responsibility to attend to the needs of others. In other words, what I'm saying is that we can't be so self-focused in the church that we determine what color the pews are and what color the carpet is and what we do and what we don't do. But it says we ought to have a responsibility for the needs of others. Yeah. Both yeah. in and out of the church. There are some folks that don't mind doing for folks that's in the church, but they say there's somebody else's responsibility. The government's responsibility to take care of those outside of the church. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that we take care of the household of faith first, but we also take care of those who are in need.
your brother. I love my mama, but you won't be with my little boy and one. I still love my mama. He had a fault like anybody else, but I'm so glad I had somebody else to look at. I was able to look at the wrong. Yeah. <laughs>